Now I'd like to introduce our first feature for this morning, and that's Suzanne Owens. Suzanne is a poet who comes from Littleton, Massachusetts. She grew up in Toronto, Canada, and her favorite pastime as a little girl was playing in the woods in back of her house, being a jungle girl. And she used to like to clear out a space in the woods and create a domicile for her dolls. Suzanne was also fond of skating and skiing and acting, and she was involved in theater as a child uh, in Canada, where they would put on three shows a year. And she added that in addition to these loves of childhood, she also loved fishing in the Laurentian Mountains in Quebec. She began writing her first, she wrote her first poem at age 11 about a horse. She went on to study in the area of writing and acting, and she received her MFA from Emerson. And Suzanne said that she likes to write poems that have been inspired by her life, including a focus on family, children, divorce, traveling. And she also added that being a part of the open mic community with m musicians has been of inspiration to her writing and performing as well. Suzanne won the A. Poulin Jr. New Poets of America series prize for her book, The Daughters of Discorda, about criminal women and the first feminists and their history and the society and laws that bound them. She's been a member of Screen Actors Guild and Actors' Equity in Canada. She's written a book, Theater Poems, about her these experiences and which won the Frank Cat Press Chapbook Award. A number of her other poems have been prize winning as well. And she has chapbooks also called In the Lake's Eye, Harvesting Ice, and Over the Edge. When Suzanne was asked, why is it important for you to write poetry? She responded, I never thought about it. It's just part of my life, like eating and sleeping, etc." One of the biggest shocks of my life as a young teen was learning that everyone doesn't do it. Through poetry, you get to know yourself and others better. You resolve fears, decisions, good and bad behavior of yourself and others. And here to show, share some poetry this morning uh, of a wide array of themes, perhaps, of different people in different places in time. We have Suzanne up to share her poetry and to be joined by musician on keyboard, Mike Santoro. So please help me welcome Suzanne Owens and Mike Santoro. I don't know what to say, because I'm too nervous. <laughs> I'd like to introduce Mike Santaro. Without him, this wouldn't be the same at all. And we've been practicing pretty hard, because this is one of the first times we've, we've done this <clears throat> together. <clears throat> and it's a whole new art form, as far as I'm concerned. And he's been very patient and understanding. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start with... Uh, a poem about a young Indian girl. Uh, for 4,000 years, an unknown tribe, the Chumash Indians, consisting of 68 villages, lived on St. Nicholas Island off the coast of California. After a raid in 1835 by white hunters, the remaining inhabitants were seized and taken to the St. Gabriel Mission. But not until 1855, 13 years later, did another mission learn of the solitary existence of the chief's daughter. She had escaped and, sw and swam to shore, and she lived for those 13 years with her dog and nobody else. She is now buried in an unmarked grave at Mission Santa Barbara. And this is her story. Mission Padres. Only the sailors saw me rise out of the grass, step onto the shore in a dress of cormorant feathers, their green sun trembling, my black hair falling royal to my hips. You sent them to rescue me, the captured child who saved herself, the plunge from the boat, the furtive swim back. You didn't see the woman 
who ran to the jetty, sprang from rock to rock. You didn't see her dive into the ocean beyond the surf line, emerge with abalone. Only the sailors saw me smash the shell, tear the meat out with my hands. I didn't offer it to you, monks, as you led me away. Only the sailors saw my face, the desolate terrain, the bronze look I threw them over my shoulder, my eyes as black as a nine-mile stretch of cold lava rock. They would have taken me back. Why did you accept me into prison mission life if not to reunite me with my tribe? They lived so nearby. Because you didn't know? Because I couldn't speak or wouldn't? High waves and clouds of spray don't struggle. Speak, you said. Didn't you hear me curse your God's will? Didn't you hear my wail, its echo fading into the fissures of your mission? A sound unlike anything you have ever heard. I was never alone, blessed by walrus, heron, sea lion, eagle, piper, pelican. You think you christened me? I christened myself with sacred water brought on gale storms by the spirits of my people who were present on my island since stone was soft. My hunted island, barren now, raised to the root by sheep, used as a bombing target, pulverized to sand. Oh, my island is not surprised when one of its own wastes away. I was gone in six weeks after stepping over the gunwale of their boat. Wet grass springs back, obliterates a footprint as soon as the foot is planted down. My conversion vanished when you took my feather dress and sent it to the Vatican. And when you caught me eating raw fish, when I refused to wear the ankle-length dress, when I walked nude in your mission gardens, and when I relieved myself by your front door, you locked me away. Why? You said, for the sake of decency. I had a language. about a serial killer uh, called Belle Guinness, and she was born in 1860 and, not, and died in 1908, and uh, they fa she found her victims through a Lonely Hearts ad that promised marriage. She owned a lot of land, and, uh, after, and a lot of men came and took out their savings and married her or whatever happened. Um, after Belle's house burned down and her children's bodies and a woman's body were discovered in the ruins, her handyman and lover was charged with the crime. Belle has never been heard of again, though there were many subsequent sightings. And the, the, the woman they found was an, an old woman who was homeless, and Belle invited her into the house uh, uh, so that they'd find her bones. And they knew that it wasn't Belle because the bones were smaller and the woman was a different uh, height, uh, but uh, uh, she got away anyway. My heart beats in wild rapture for you. Come prepared to stay forever. Like explorers following a trade route, my lovers came. 
No vile despoilers answered my honey-kissed ad. They dug out their life savings from the local banks, as boggle-eyed as the deputies who unearthed the bones and eleven men's watches in my hog pen. A plague pit of death and quicklime. Like triflers who need not apply, the winds rose over those soft spots under my lilacs. Ashes stole off on the lamb by the burned butcher shop where I slaughtered my hogs in, the, in my overalls. More bodies cut up, wrapped in gunny sacks, fell away under their shovels. Forty-two lying out in that red carriage shed. When deputies found my teeth in the smolder, the whole village mourned, poor widow and her charred children. They accused my handyman, the lover I fired, the one who bragged in the bar the same night I burned down my house, ripped out the stump of my real anchor tooth with the false plate still attached and threw it all into the blaze. Now I live the high life in New York, disguised as a man, while he dies spitting blood in a cell. He always said, what china blue eyes you have. This is about the rudeness in our society, and uh, especially with drivers. And uh, it's the way I have of making my rant. It's called Apache Country. Once, late at night, driving home from some small town, I pulled over on the shoulder in the dark to let a tailgater pass by. But tonight, today, rather, on a lonely country road, driving over a narrow bridge that crosses the river with the mountains changing colors all around, a large black truck fills my rearview mirror. The angel of death shimmers behind me, almost kissing my bumper, while the mirror reflects obscene gestures. I stop my car, get out, smile, walk back to him. His head leans out the open window, a caged bear waiting to be fed. He yells, Damn you, lady, who the hell taught you how to drive? Even though mafia drifts before my eyes, I don't care if he's six foot five, a serial killer, or has a gun. I myself am packing heat. Hi, how's your day? Can you feel Mother Earth as you drive over her back? His face changes, not to shock exactly, but bewilderment. Do, do you know the Apache people see a river as the circle of life and the mountains holding us to spiritual connections? So I ask you, just where are you going? Are you famous? Are you important like our sacred Oprah? I wave at the sky. I wondered if you saw it all. Mechanically, he scans the sky. Can you see? It's entirely blue, not one cloud. And can you hear that flock of geese? Bite me, lady, bite me. Can't you feel the cool air? Not freezing yet, but fresh, with the smell of winter in it. Now, look over there at those trees, how they catch the light, pure gold. In two weeks, all will have vanished. His eyes dart around, fearful yet incredulous. Did you know Tall Bull of the Northern Cheyenne tribe says, you 
use your senses, experience the gifts of smell, touch, hearing, taste, and sight. He says these are all needed for our healing. We must take time to see the beauty, to feel Mother Earth as we walk on her back. What's this all about? Are you out of your mind? Well, do you know Apache people put their unhealthy feelings in a rock? That's why you never pick up a rock when you're in Apache country. For it said that you might pick up another's anger and tribulations. He guns the gas. Screw you, lady. As I go back to my car, I wave goodbye. Enjoy your life. Treasure this day. It could be your last. Driving on, I imagine our rocky Massachusetts soil. All the stones within. And wonder, would there be enough if we were in Apache country? Um, about another woman uh, who was betrayed by a pirate called Black Sam Bellany. It was said that the young farm girl was seduced and abandoned by a pirate called Black Bellamy. He left without her and went to the Caribbean after getting her pregnant. And she uh, had the baby and was imprisoned for killing it and then went insane in prison. Then she was mysteriously freed, and nobody quite knows the story about how, but she would run, uh, she was run out of town and lived in a hut by the ocean and used to pace up and down the cliffs yelling his name. And uh, a price was on his head finally in the Caribbean, so he, he tried to return, but his ship sank off the coast of Cape, Cape Cod in a hurricane. <clears throat> The Sea Witch of Billingsgate to her betrayer. I can see you, Black Bellamy, through the glass eye of my gray goat. Sail the widow with your crew further than the sun dares. The maid you ruined under the wild plum will lock your pirate's legs in a fishtail. You will sing myrrh songs to the lobsters. When the fog makes arc shapes with the shoals, hips, shoulders, the form a girl takes lying in a barn, I will cut up tempests around your ship, hurricanes. You will gaze spellmoored at the granite, as I did at the stranger in French bombast who freed me. I touched his gold quill to my tongue, drew my mark with a slantendicular X. The scarlet tip glittered. Oh, no black art of yours will flick the reefs away like stray bits of rye straw as he flicked away my iron, my prison bars, and tapped the silver darbies on my wrist with his cane. I live in Leviathan now. A ship's light flies from his tail. Counter charms will not rid the hymn bellowers of me. Let everyone stick pins in calves' hearts. Drop all the hearts down, all the chimneys in town. I am a deep-dyed sinner, a white girl, a red girl. I have more lives than my familiar. But some nights, I lure a skipper or a young hand to the lorn hut on the poverty grass meadow. Occasion, some return before cock crow, withered and creak jointed. Watch for the glimpse of my 
Red Heels. <clears throat> Thank you. And the last poem is about um, a, a very famous star uh, of all uh, of everything, a uh, wonderful, wonderful woman. I got really tied up in writing 18 pages of poems about her. But this is just one. And uh, her name was Fanny Bryce. And uh, at 13, Fanny gave her first performance at, at Amateur Night in the Keeney Theatre. She crossed all the borders in the entertainment world of that time. She was a star of the Follies vaudeville movies. She attained fame as the spoiled bratty child, Baby Snooks on the Radio. She married Nick Arnstein, and her first child was born August 12, 1999. But Nick was a real uh, a bad guy, and he went, he, he went to federal prison for three years when the baby was six months old, and then he was charged with a Wall Street bond theft and sentenced to the federal penitentiary at Leavenworth in 1927. And, but she never left him, and she stuck by him and took him his, his lunch every day in prison, and finally, uh, her, her song, My Man, uh, became her signature song and very famous. Thank God, uh, she finally met, married her third husband, Billy Rose, and had a very nice life. But uh, the, uh, the uh, My Man song is, uh, was her signature song, and very, very famous. And she's known for that, from that song. And this is the last poem in the, in the bunch, and it's called A Funny Person. She was a comedian, but she also did very, very dramatic parts. She was a great dramatic actress as well. The Funny Person. Nick and I both played our parts, but the out-of-bounds criminal who broke all the rules refused to bend. He could never stand still long enough to come clean. A member of the Gondorf band and the great Bond plot, he knew how to shake hands as if he was the Secretary of Foreign Affairs. He said he knew a lot of big people, princes, nobles, but I never met one of them. No silks, no aristocrats, only dreams of glory. Why, the best friends I've ever known were W.C. Fields and Will Rogers. When I was under constant surveillance, they stood guard in front of my dressing room door, and I didn't even know it. Nick couldn't face the truth. He was a child inside. And I, well, I was the actress, the funny person, tricked by the star I pretended to be. I've lived in illusion as if i have been on stage all my life. I don't know if Nick put away five million stolen dollars from Wall Street. All I know, he withdrew a thousand lies and broken promises to give me when all I had was one heart. So many people put on a mask, that mask of loyalty and friendship so they can watch your heart break when you take off your own. Even though I sing, my man, I won't cry in front of you. So don't you cry in front of me. When you're a funny person, you're not entitled to cry. People don't expect it. It costs me a lot, but there's one thing I've got. It's my man. Cold and wet, tired, you bet. But all that I soon forget with my man. He's not much for looks, and no hero of books is my man. Two or three girls has he that he likes as well as me. But I love him. Oh, my man, 
I love him so. He'll never know. All my life is just despair, but I don't care. When he takes me in his arms, the world is bright. All is right. What's the difference if I say I'll go away? When I know I'll come back on my knees someday. For whatever my man is, I am his forever more. Oh, my man, I love him so, he'll never know. All my life is just despair, but I don't care. When he takes me in his arms, the world is bright, all right. What's the difference if I say, I'll go away? When I know I'll come back on my knees someday. For whatever my man is, I am his forever. Richard Hoffman comes from Cambridge, Massachusetts. He grew up in Allentown, Pennsylvania in the 50s and 60s, which is the setting for his memoir, Half the House. As a child, one of his favorite pastimes was experiencing solitary, peaceful moments in the midst of a family that was chaotic with suffering and illness when he would go outside and he would tie trout flies and later go fishing on the local streams with those creations. Richard began writing poems about the time that he left home and he said, already I knew that a single poem could offer what Robert Frost called a momentary stay against confusion and I was very confused. Once I had written a poem that actually calmed me and helped me manage my emotional chaos, in the midst of what he shared of his family background, he said, I was so grateful that I gave myself over to poetry completely. After leaving home, Richard went on to continue writing, and he now has two books of poetry with titles Without Paradise and Gold Star Road. Gold Star Road was selected as a book by Molly Peacock for the Barrow Street Poetry Prize in 2006. He also has a book that is his memoir called Half the House, which was awarded the Boston Athenium Reader's Prize in 1996. And he also has a short story collection, Interference and Other Stories, that will be published by New Rivers Press in the fall. Richard has also received fellowships from New Jersey Council for the Arts, the Massachusetts Artist Foundation for Nonfiction Prose, and the Massachusetts Cultural Council for Fiction. He's also been awarded the Charles Angoff Award for his essay, Pictures of Boyhood. Richard holds the position of writer in residence at Emerson College, where he teaches writing and literature. He also teaches in the Stone Coast MFA graduate program in creative writing in Maine. I also asked Richard for a funniest moment in sharing his poetry with others. And Richard said, recently I was reading at a school for National Poetry Month, and the ninth grade theater arts teacher required each of her students to memorize one of my poems and recite it on stage, with me in the front row. Those kids turned red, sweat, shook, screwed up, backed up, and started over and apologized. And I thought to myself, by God, I've arrived. My poems are being used to torture middle school students. <laughs> I also asked Richard, why do you think it's important to share poetry in books and out loud as well? And he said, poetry, whether in verse or prose, is composed to be heard, 
It is different from the merely documentary because it is a voice in your ear. That voice wants to engage you on a deeper level than information. What we take in through our eyes as print generally, generally is understood from the eyebrows up. What we take in through our ears has the chance to move us in our bodies, in our hearts. At the same time, our understanding is engaged. That's why poems can be so satisfying. They are reintegrating, they offer wholeness. So we look forward to taking part in this experience as we hear the powerful poetry of Richard Hoffman this morning. My teachers always suggested that you begin a reading with a poem by another poet. I'm gonna cheat a little bit on that score today and read something that uh, I wrote with another poet. Okay, uh, my dear friend Linda McCarriston and I have been engaged in a conversation for about 25 years uh, about the power of poetry, the restorative power of poetry, the, the uh, way that poetry can restore equilibrium. Uh, it's related to issues of justice and, uh, um, and reconciliation. And this was a poem that we worked on together and it's called Generations. Isaac takes Abraham for a walk in the woods. Hansel and Gretel take Daddy. Snow White invites her stepmother. The woods are the story. The paths are worn to the altar, the oven, the cave. Something's wrong, though. The kids have been reading. It takes a lot to coax their elders from the trails. From above comes nothing but daylight. From afar, a chalky moon and the first few stars. One could get lost here, cry, meet death, as one day everyone, one way or another, will. The huntsman in a tree stand, a block of salt below him. Where are we going? Further into the tale than you imagined, Father. Further than the bloody fable had allowed us. There, where the cliffs loom over the seething sea, the rocks below. This is a poem called Refugee. A man carries his door the door of his house, because when the war is over, he is going home, where he will hang it on its hinges and lock it tight while he tries to remember the word for welcome. If his house is gone when he returns, he will raise it from rubble around this door. If he cannot return, the door will remember the rest of the house, so he can build it again elsewhere. And if he cannot go on, his door can be a pallet for his rest, a stretcher to carry him, his shade from sun, his shield. Thank you. You know, that's a real phenomenon uh, among refugee communities. You'll see these uh, makeshift huts and uh, uh, encampments with these very beautiful ornate doors, sometimes all just sticking up or leaning against a tree. It's a very, it, I had an argument, well, I didn't have an argument. A student came to me once and said, now is that, and I explained that story to her and she said, yes, my teacher said it was only a metaphor. <laughs> so I got her some extra credit. <laughs> Uh, this is a poem called Bosnia Aftermath, and uh, it's dedicated to a, a friend of mine, a photojournalist named Sarah Terry, who, has, who began uh, what she now calls the Aftermath Project in Bosnia after the war. And she charted for 10 years how these communities uh, reconcile themselves to atrocity. How do people live together again? How do communities uh, regain enough trust to go on? Um, 
she then went on to uh, Rwanda and did the project there, and she's been documenting that uh, that reconciliation, and now she's in Sierra Leone. Uh, there are a lot of places for her to go. Um, it's her contention that, you know, the news media uh, leaves and heads off to the next war as soon as the truce is signed, uh, and that the real lessons that we have to learn are in the aftermath. Um, so this is dedicated to her. It's called Bosnia Aftermath. A trout on a riverbank knows where the river is. A fox in a trap knows the time. But a man or woman only knows the story hope tells or fear and often chooses wrong. No ant will enter another's hill, no bee another's hive, and a rook atop a dead oak knows which side it's on. But a man or woman led by liars will discuss calmly who should dig the pit, and if it is a better lesson to slaughter the neighbor's babies first or afterward, a squirrel burrows deep in a hollow trunk. The bear returns to her darkened cave. But a man or woman, gorged on blood, deep in history, asleep, dreams peace, and waking says, peace is a dream. A rabbit may cower, but only so long. The common sparrow knows the seasons. But a man or woman only wants a song, a poem, a religion to profess that no one who has known goodness even once is ever wholly lost. <laughs> Thank you. The predicament we seem to be in as uh, Westerners and as first world people uh, is how to negotiate the vast amounts of information that we receive about what's going on in the rest of the world. And on the one hand, there's the, there's the temptation to turn away, and on the other, uh, there is, uh, we can easily be overwhelmed. And I think that the Polish uh, Nobel laureate, Wisława Zimborska, put her finger on that in the two lines that are the epigraph to this poem. Uh, she writes, tortures are just what they were. Only the earth has shrunk, and whatever goes on sounds as if it's just a room away. This is called Headache Clinic. Yes, the pain is worse since last time I was here. I've tried to become accustomed to it. Last night, while I was trying to find a comfortable position and wondering if I should take a pill, a man a couple of miles from here came home, walked quietly upstairs, took out his gun, and murdered his wife and two children, a boy and a girl, while they slept. The paper had photos. He shot himself, too. A 14-year-old's parents want to know who duct taped the bombs to his hairless chest under the Warner Brothers t-shirt his uncle brought him with a cap from Florida last year. Doctor, when you shine that pen light in my eyes, do you see the man take off his shoes inside the door so as not to wake his sleeping wife and kids? You want me to point to the part of my head that hurts? That's it, that part. I can follow your finger, yes, from where the boy left the small repair garage, past the tented bookstall and the cashew vendors, to where he entered the crowded restaurant. Do you see her, the woman, her finger in the air, who has just caught the eye of the waiter? On a scale of one to ten, your pen in hand, you ask, how badly does it hurt right now? 
<laughs> I'm going to read a couple of poems about work. These are jobs that I had. Uh, um, this is a little emblematic poem called Doorman. <clears throat> Bright buttons, white gloves, polished shoes. I kept the glass clean and the brass knobs shining. A captain's hat and trousers creased and striped. Some tatting on the sleeves, a touch of braid. It might almost have been a soldier's uniform. Over and over, day after day, I opened the same door for the same rich people who pretended to think we were equals while I, who needed the job to pay rent, pretended to believe they thought so. I was so bored it made me happy to run into the street and blow my little whistle, then stand there holding the door of a cab as if I'd just caught a great big fish. Even if what I do now doesn't matter as much as I want to think it does, even if I'm a fool in other ways than I was back then. I never want to do that kind of work again, over and over, day after day, opening the same door for the same rich people. <clears throat> and, and this is a very different experience. It's, uh, it's called Summer Job. It's a little bit different kind of poem. The trouble with intellectuals, Manny, my boss, once told me, is that they don't know nothing till they can explain it to themselves. A guy like that, he says, he gets to middle age, and by the way, he gets there late. He's trying hard to be a boy until he's 40, 45. And then you give him five more years till that craziness peters out, and now he's almost 50. A guy like that at last explains to himself that life is made of time, that time is what it's all about. Aha, he says. And then he either blows his brains out, gets religion, or settles down to some major league depression. Make yourself useful. Hand me that 3 h torque wrench. No, you moron, the other one. <laughs> I, I can't say that was verbatim, but it is a memory. And this is called A Good While. I thought of the time I sliced my thumb and how even there, where the nerve endings are most acute, where the sensitivity resides that touched by each finger in turn made us human, demanded that the ganglions of the head learn to cooperate and grow and count and speak. Even there, with the little cap and piece of nail sliced off, for a good while, I felt nothing but regret. Oh, why'd I go and do that? No pain, not yet. And I thought, then maybe a frightened soldier, hit by a bullet, might just die before the pain could start. Feeling suddenly woozy, sleepy, thinking, oh, I'm hit. Blood pressure dropping fast, dizzy and darkening, maybe saying to himself, oh boy, I hope this isn't dying. And I prayed, especially for the sake of my neighbor's son, that that's more or less the way it happens. This is a new poem. Uh, I just get so fed up with rhetoric, uh, with the rhetoric of justification um, and excuses. And it's called a man like that. The enemy hid himself among civilians. He didn't have even the decency to spare his parents and his three-year-old sister. You see what I mean? A man like that cares nothing for life. A man like that is without a conscience. A man like that can sit there among them, stocking feet up, watching TV, eating dates and pistachios, 
while missiles crashed through the roof, spewing phosphorus on his aged uncle and cousins, even the baby, without a qualm. What kind of a man is that? Too cowardly even to stay alive and watch them burn. Doesn't he make you angry, a man like that? Uh, this is a room full of poetry lovers, so you know the old story that this refers to. Uh, it's the story of Orpheus and Eurydice. It's called An Old Story. A few days after my mother died, the furnace went out, and my father, who had been sitting in his chair across from hers since the funeral, his unshaven chin on his chest, heaved himself up and went down the cold gray cellar stairs to see if he could relight the pilot himself or would have to call for help. I know what it must have been like because I remember him other times on his back down there, cursing match after match, damning each for burning his fingers as he reached through the tiny metal door as many times as it took. This time, it lit, caught, and roared back to life. When my father sat up, he faced the washer, the dryer, the empty laundry basket, the ironing board, and my mother's radio above the sink. Her absence so vivid that climbing the stairs, he thought he heard her behind him, and he turned around. <clears throat> This villanelle is called The Wave. Uh, it was written during my father's last illness, and I tried to imagine, it, were he a poet, how he might uh, speak what he might say. The Wave begins with an epigraph from Yeats. Grant me an old man's frenzy, myself must I remake. How does a swell become a wave? What pushes up from underwater? Tell me, this tired body is all I have become of all I tried to be. I move more slowly now and have to wonder, how does a swell become a wave? There isn't much I wouldn't give to feel time's promise rise and gather again in this tired body. But if all I have is this one heavy life, then let me heave it somehow, all of it, into the future, the way a swell becomes a wave that rolls for miles to a beach or cove or thunders on rock and shatters. I am tired of this tired body. All I have to live for, my children, others I love, some days I'm so fatigued they hardly matter. How does a swell become a wave? Tell me, this tired body is all I have. <laughs> this poem uh, is a pantoum, and it's... Uh, it's written in memory of my brother, Bob, who died of muscular dystrophy in 1972. It's called, But You Are Gone. I thought for a long time, if I was very quiet for a long time, I might recall your voice. If I was very quiet, I might long for you so long, I might recall your voice as if my ear could sift the wind. I might long for you so long for words you had spoken, as if my ear could sift the wind for things you said, for words you had spoken, that if I searched my memory for things you said, I might find you again that if I searched my memory for a long time, I might find you again, I thought for a long time. 
<laughs> I'm coming to the end here. Maybe I'll skip this one. This is called ontology, which are, for you philosophers is the study of being. In every age, there are two people charged with holding up the sky. Neither of them are aware of it. They just do it. It's who they are. Others who know them are aware that something's different about them and respond to them with either adulation or hatred, at times both, which amounts to envy. Usually, the two never meet. However, sometimes, after many eons, the simple law of averages requires they come to know each other, even intimately and inextricably. Those two were your parents, but you knew that, didn't you? <laughs> Um, two short poems, and then I'll be finished. This is called Watching. Because I lay on my back as a boy in the grass of the small yard behind our house, watching clouds move and become faces, mostly. I was able to sit for a long time holding my dying mother's hand as her sleeping face changed like a field in the sun under moving clouds. And to hold my newborn grandson now and watch his features changing moment to moment, propelled by some inner wind, I suppose, must be like dreaming. And because this watching is above, after, and before words, I am unable to describe what I believe I understand and how it comforts and sustains me. <clears throat> Thank you. And I, I like to end with this poem. You'll see why. It's, uh, it's called At St. Peter's. The Pope is in the window looking down at all the pilgrims gathered in the square. He proffers a dove in his shaking hands, and when he releases it, it drops to the sill, then flies back into the room. A cardinal falls to the floor to try to coax the frightened bird from underneath a chair. Veni, veni, he says, twisting and reaching. But the pope begins to weep because, like all his predecessors, he has failed to talk the saints down from their ledge. He crosses the air in a blessing that seems abrupt now, a dismissal, as if to say, go on, go away, all of you, go home. Thank you. Thank you. And now we're moving on to the third part of this morning's feature, where we will get to hear the songs and music of Jane Fallon. Jane comes from New Hampshire. She grew up in Sacramento Valley, California, on a 60-acre farm next to her mother's father. Her youth was spent in a virtual garden of Eden, filled with the best California could provide in flora and fauna. Jane said, I loved picking the spearmint that grew all around, the natural spring that fed the hand-dug swimming pool, and she enjoyed playing games with her five siblings on the, a large lawn and rambling solo through the freshly cut hay at dusk. She said she had a book in one hand and a pomegranate in the other. At the age, uh, at an early age, when she first began to hum, she was beginning to make up her own tunes. Jane said that she seemed to sing more than she spoke in her family. And her brothers were known to tease her about it as she grew into adolescence. Sometimes it would come up at high school, I guess, in the halls and so forth. Sing me, sing me your words now, you know, sing me what's going on today. She grew up in a musical family, 
blessed with voices on both sides. Her parents were both renowned vocalists. And Jane said family trips were always accompanied by four-part hymns, with her dad taking lead and every child pitching in. Family gatherings included sing-alongs around the fire with a guitar in every hand. And Jane said, I was raised Baptist, and no one sings like the Baptists. From the age of 10 to 16, she toured California as part of the Ross Girls Trio. And then in high school, she was a lead singer in a band called Wisteria. Oh, I'm sorry, in college years. She went on to college and then graduate school in English literature and spent some time in Scotland and went on in her work both in teaching as a college professor in English and writing, as well as her own work as a singer-songwriter in performing, writing and performing. Her music and her voice has been described as ear candy by Steve Rapson. Christine Lavin, the comedian and folk singer, called Jane's work very funny. And she has four CDs to her credit and has won awards for her songwriting and has been performing for 30 years throughout New England. When I asked Jane, why write songs? Jane said, why is it important to breathe? Writing songs is not something I think about. It's just something I can't seem to keep from doing. And we're so happy that she's here with us today to share some of her songs with us. Please help me welcome Jane Fallon. Swirls deep in her heart, she knows she's 
ambivalence in that song. I was raised in a, um, partly in a big farm in California. And when that farm basically got um, taxed out from underneath us, my dad had to sell. And um, California taxes were terrible. This is before the Proposition 2 and a half, And became a manager of a cattle ranch. Um, and he, he amazed me, because this is a man who was a Depression baby, grew up in Arkansas, sharecropper's son. Somehow taught himself how to bring the cattle in, when to inoculate them, um, how to build the fences, how to make the hay. And I somehow don't know exactly how he did that, but he managed a multi-million dollar cattle ranch, not ever having been exposed to one until he was uh, in his 30s. So I wrote this song about my dad, inspired by a photo I saw of Madonna with a cowboy hat on. <laughs> saw a cowboy hat today on a celebrity. She was looking cute and perky on the front of her CD, and I wondered if she'd ever fixed a fence out in the rain. I kept a half her company through her birthing pain. Well, folks, if she ain't done that, she don't deserve the hat. A banker in a cowboy bar in NYC. In his Stetson and his bolo tie was as cute as he could be And I wondered if he'd ever spent 12 hours at a time Eating trail dust, swatting flies, covered with grime Cause folks, if he ain't done that, he don't deserve the hat Well, the cowboy hat's a symbol of the ones who tamed the West Sheltered them through wind and sun and snow Made a handy pillow when it came time to rest. They wore it for utility and not for show. Now my daddy is a cowboy who's paid his dues. He has earned his spurs, his belt buckle, his jeans of blue. With his barbed wire scarred hands, his perpetual tan, and eyes that stay squinted when the sun has gone to bed. Somehow I know he's earned the hat he wears. On his head. I don't know much, but I know that he deserves a hat. Now, cowboy gear is all the rage today, I realize. For some folks, it's simply just how they accessorize. I don't mind that. Go out and have your fun, but someday when you're all alone and the partying is done, take off that hat. Put it over your heart. Look up to the heavens and say, I don't know much, but I know that. I don't deserve the hat. Well, my daddy is a cowboy who's paid his dues. He has earned his spurs, his belt buckle, his jeans of blue. With his barbed wire scarred hands, his perpetual tan, and eyes that stay squinted when the sun has gone to bed. Somehow I know he's earned the hat he wears on his head. I don't know much, but I know that he deserves a hat. I don't know much, but I know that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, my dad could do everything, basically. He was self-taught, um, hammer and nail, build anything, built barns, built our houses, it wired our electricity, fixed anything that was going around. I think the saddest thing I ever found out was about a few years ago, I had a rental car, it broke down. Daddy came to haul me to the service station and said, you know, I can't fix them anymore. They all take fancy machines. Can't do it. You know, it used to be you could do them by look, crawl underneath and look and see if it was, but now they need all this calibration and stuff. So that's, he's a dinosaur, I guess. But uh, when I left home, it was the first time I found out after college what it cost to have a car fixed because my dad had already done it. So I wrote this song. This is on Car Talk. And uh, it alludes to a couple of contemporary figures. And uh, Christine Lavinoy says, when you do po comedy, and you're dealing with contemporary issues, it has a short shelf life. But these are still uh, people you will recognize, hopefully, and um, the rhymes are too good to let go, though poor Patrick Swayze is not uh, doing too well these days. Remember him when he was in Dirty Dancing. 
You may not have two thoughts to rub together. You may not have the sense to come in from the weather. You may think that cheese is what the moon is made up of. But if you can fix my car, I'm in love. If you can fix my car, I'm in love. We don't need the stars and moon above. You win my affection if you mend my fuel injection. If you can fix my car, I'm in love. You may not have the you may not have the looks of Patrick Swayze. The girls in town may not sigh, swoon, or go crazy. You may have a face only your mom can be fond of. But if you can fix my car, I'm in love. If we can fix my car, I'm in love. We don't need the stars and moon above. You're the man I want around when my spark plugs let me down. If you can fix my car, I'm in love. You may have the shape of Roseanne's hubby. And even your ears might be looking kind of chubby. You may be a wimp when push comes round to shove. But if you can fix my car, I'm in love. If you can fix my car, I'm in love. We don't need the stars and moon. If you keep my wheels in motion, if you can fix my car, I'm in love. A dub, a dub, dub. I love a dub, a dub, dub. Doop, a dub, a doop, 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 a doop. I get so excited when my engine is ignited. You know, I'll see you later if you tune my carburetor. You'll be my loving man if you clean my oil pan. Can you rotate a tire? Well, it sets my heart on fire. If you can fix my car, I'm in love. Thank you. people who have an echo of sentiment there. I think the next one has got to be the, if you can fix my computer, I'm in love. That's got to be, that's on my, that's on my desk right now. I'm writing this as we speak, but um, no, it's been great hanging out with my dad. I go out every summer and the summer we'll go out and um, drive around for about a a month because he had a stroke last summer and then he's recuperated very well but he knows he can't get in a pickup truck I can still drive well I know you can drive daddy but not alone five hours across the desert so I'm going out we're going to take him to visit everybody my mom passed away two years ago and um, I had written a song last summer about her and I made a CD and I put a picture on the front that I found somewhere that I'd never seen before she was about 20 years old and my dad says oh yeah that she bought that dress to go have her picture taken um, and to give to me as a special present for Christmas and she forgot she was going to surprise me so he told me a story I had never heard before in my life about my mom and I wrote this song She wore a blue dress with the white collar It brought out the darkness of her eyes Young and sweet and eager, trying hard to please, she forgot it was to be a surprise. Soon to be married, they went driving into town. She said, there's an errand I must run. He said, sure, no problem, I'll just sit and read the paper, and I'll be waiting for you when you're done. She caught her reflection in the drugstore window, paused a moment, checked her lipstick for smears, then posed for the camera, lips parted, smiling shyly, gift for her lover through the years. She wore a blue dress with the white collar. It brought out the darkness of her eyes. Young and sweet and eager and trying hard to please, she forgot it was to be a surprise. She opened up the car door, sidled over, squeezed his arm, her deed still dancing in his eyes. Then without thinking, she blurted out her story, she forgot it was to be a surprise. And champagne's uncorked, those bubbles just start rising. How could she suppress a thing so grand? 
She blushed when she remembered it was meant to be a secret Till she held that photo in her hand Trying hard to blink back the tears An empty chair, a presence gone All that's left's a photograph, a gift For a lover through the years She wore a blue dress with the white collar It brought out the darkness of her eyes Thank you. Thank you very much. And there's, you know, I mentioned, Cheryl mentioned songs of loss, and she was trying to forecast everything, and I heard Richard's uh, poem and talking about his father. And um, my mother had Parkinson's disease, and I know after she passed away, my dad says, you know, every three hours, I remember it's time to give her her medication. You do that for 15 years, and you remember. So it took a long time. Probably, he still remembers. Sometimes in the middle of the night, he, he probably thinks... He hears her, and it's time to give her her medication. So I had the, two verses of this song uh, written, and it's about it's about losing it's about those those terrible kinds of losses, and I wonder how people deal with them, like losing your 16 year old child to a car accident or whatever that I kept reading about. I didn't know how to finish it, and after Mom died, I knew how to finish it. A bomb goes off in Baghdad. Nothing's left of someone's baby boy A folded flag in his mama's hands As his daddy stands, his shoulder shakes as he tries To forget the pain and remember all the joy And somehow they'll manage to go on But with every step they take They will always know Part of them is gone And there's a hobo in an alleyway Asleep beneath the front page news Target of the pelting rain Wearing someone else's worn out shoes And hope is what is left inside Some kids discarded Dixie cup You swallow it like wounded pride So hungrily you suck it up It's only 10 a.m. Her hands around a half-gone bottle of Tanguary gin. Somehow it seems to ease the pain. The day the plane brought down the towers on that September morning. That's where it began. Somehow she knows that she'll go on. But with every breath she takes, she will always know. Some of her faith is gone And there's a hobo in an alleyway Asleep beneath the front page news Target of the pelting rain Wearing someone else's worn out shoes And hopes what is left inside Some kids discarded Dixie cup You swallow it like wounded pride So hungrily you suck it up Sixty years right by his side From the day she said she'd be his bride To the day they put her in the ground And he knows that she won't be around And sometimes makes him want to cry But somehow he knows that he'll go on But the days and the nights are long When the only one you love forever will be gone Here's to the walking wounded. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
I'd like to thank Cheryl for having me, and I'd like to thank uh, Susanna and Richard for sharing the stage with me, and all of you for listening. And I'd like to leave you on a sad note, so I'll do a really quick a cappella song. I grew up a cappella singing with all my family in the car, my dad's singing lead, and all of us picking apart. Uh, and so this is how we'll end today. I know a girl named Della sings out on the street. Snaps her fingers, taps her toes, keeps a steady beat. And she don't need no guitar, no piano keys. And she don't need no banjo to keep her company. She sings doo up, doo up, dap, doo wah, doo up, doo wow. She lee doop doop, doobly shoop shoop, sweep sweep, doop doo wah doo wah, bee bop bee bop, shoo shoo shoo. Acapella Ella singing unaccompanied. And now Acapella Ella began to feel alone. Thought she'd find a fella to call her very own. And one day on the street, heard the sweetest thing. He was cool and he was hip and all oh, that boy could swing. He sang doo-wop, doo-wop, dop, doo-wop, 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 wow. Shootly doop, doop, doobly shoop, shoop, sweep, sweep. Doop, doo-wop, doo-wop, bee-bop, bee-bop, shoo, 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 Shaking it and baking it unaccompanied. And now acapella Ella and her acapella guy snapped their fingers. Fingers tap their toes, watch the world go by. And they don't need no banjo and no piano keys. And they don't need no guitar to keep them company. They sing doo up, doo up, dop, doo up, doo up, dop, doo wow. Shootly doop doop, doobly shoop shoop, sweep sweep, doop doo wa doo wa, bee bop, bee bop, shoo shoo shoo. Acapella Ella and your acapella fella singing on a company. Doo up, doo up, doo up, doo up, doo up, doo up. Do wow. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>
I cannot grieve for him as a widow for her husband, since he left a life unarmed, unharmed, waving goodbye with his left hand, pushing the cart with the right. In the morning in his new home, the depth of night where I am, he gets up, walks naked, and turns on the coffee maker. A new woman follows him. At the end of my day, I lie in an empty bed while he, unaware, asleep, in his sweet dream, draws a slow breath, moves his arm about, and finds her body now. I cannot mourn he's gone, put a long bless, black dress on, black shoes, cover my head with a black scarf, and wail till my sorrow reaches heaven, because where he went is not the realm of dead souls, just a different piece of land on the other side of the ocean. Uh, in response to Jane Fallon, I, uh, I drove out here from Boston this morning with my old pickup truck that I tuned up this morning with the grease <laughs> and my thing, you know. And I do, I'm a carpenter and I do have the boots. So, so there are a few of us out there. The alarm clock ringing while he shaves, he smiles then thinks aloud. If these just these four walls where no pictures hang, is there really any sound? It takes a lot of living to make a house a home. It takes the body heat of two to face the bitter cold. Hearts were meant for giving, hands were meant to hold, but you've got to prove it to another soul. The day shift ends, the traffic jams, the cold sun slowly fades, the mailbox empty, cupboard bare, and down go the window shades. It used to be the seasons defined the age of man, but now it's played in day-by-day -day detail. What he once were considered reasons are excuses drawn in sand. He goes out once again to check the mail. The night winds blow, the news grows old. He rests his weary head, the pillow worn to a familiar fold. He loves his quilted bed. It takes a lot of living to make a house a home. It takes the body heat of two to face the bitter cold. Hearts were meant for giving, hands were meant to hold, but you've got to prove it to another soul. Thank you. From the western suburbs I fetched up where Black Sam Bellamy did, down on Cape Cod, and there I met a lot of new friends. Among them is William E. Dickinson, Dickinson was born a short drive from his ancestor, Emily Dickinson's birthplace in Amherst, Mass. His writing started after breaking backbones in a fall in 1988, and his penchant for writing soon became 2,000 poems, many published. I'm going to read a couple of them. Two shorelines, epic reminders of nature's realm, true measures of winter's grasp, white caked ice, along miles of shore, along white beaches as lonely reminder of summer's past, deep blue cold of changing sea beyond this frozen helm, promise of new Arctic fleece toward the shore's untold sum, the eyes of untold access beyond the sheen of now present the fathomless depths of winter's strutting prow. Angelic voice in wind not heard, whistle down the winter's pike, how long the smothered sea at last beyond two shorelines bay tonight. The second poem of Bill's is Veins of Grace. A feather in the wind, stilled by lack of breeze, retains its lightness, beauty, allowing eye to see. Its delicate veins of grace, the sunlight through, through to view, allowing wind to pick up again into constant motion, new. Now into air aloft, framed by the big blue sky, movement untamed, light projectile. From ground it now rises and gathers its momentum, blowing as a gale. Movement as a friend I know, although she's a little pale. 
Bill is always encouraging me in my own poetry, and I'm encouraging him, and he's much more worthy of it. But I'll finish with something I happen to remember. I wrote long enough ago that you can identify it by the compound adjective in it. it how long ago I wrote this. I sit and ponder on the John about the view before me. The hieroglyphics on the wall have never ceased to bore me. Among Revlon, with Revlon's best $2 tube, among remarks obscene, romances are recorded here within this foul latrine. Why are such sacred romances engraved and painted thus, and sweet relationships profaned by smells offending us? <laughs> Saw a cowboy hat today on a celebrity. She was looking cute and perky on the front of her CD, and I wondered if she'd ever fix the fence out in the rain. I kept the half her company through her birth and pain. Well, folks, if she ain't done that, she don't deserve the hat. A banker in a cowboy bar in NYC. And his Stetson and his bolo tie was as cute as he could be And I wondered if he'd ever spent 12 hours at a time Eating trail dust, swatting flies, covered with grime Cause folks, if he ain't done that, he don't deserve the hat Well, the cowboy hat's a symbol of the ones who tamed the West Sheltered them through wind and sun and snow Made a handy pillow when it came time to rest. They wore it for utility and not for show. Now my daddy is a cowboy who's paid his dues. He has earned his spurs, his belt buckle, his jeans of blue. With his barbed wire scarred hands, his perpetual tan, and eyes that stay squinted when the sun has gone to bed. Somehow I know he's earned the hat he wears on his head I don't know much but I know that he deserves a hat Now cowboy gear is all the rage today I realize For some folks it's simply just how they accessorize I don't mind that Go out and have your fun But someday when you're all alone and the partying is done Take off that hat Put it over your heart. Look up to the heavens and say, I don't know much, but I know that I don't deserve the hat.